morning, everyone. This is Laura, and this is Stuff I Find Interesting. I'm going to move this back just a little bit. I'm feeling kind of like, I don't know, like maybe I want to be a little more, not quite so. Bam! There we go. That's a little better, right? This way I can be more, more in line and not like, 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 like I'm riding, <laughs> riding in a car. <laughs> All right, uh, today is a snow day for me. My name is Laura. This is Stuff I Find Interesting. I'm from New York, and I post stuff I find interesting, and I talk about it, and that's it. So it's kind of like sitting, I guess, sitting with your, your, your aunt, like at the computer, or your cousin or whomever, and they're like, ooh, look at this, ooh, look at this, and you're just like, uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. That's what we're doing. So if you're into that kind of thing, boy, do I got you covered. All right. Starting off, Materia Prima. This is a architecture magazine, but it's dedicated to sustainability. Uh, this, like everything else I post from or talk about from here on in, will be in the links so you can go back and you can look at it. Um, I generally don't talk about stuff too exhaustively. I let you do that. I will not talk about it, but look at it. I generally just kind of introduce it and then you can do what you want with it um, because if I go too deep with everything I'll be here for like three hours so materia prima and this the reason why I was thinking about this is because I've been working on some mining stuff and this is about um, what mining does to the landscape and it's just some pictures and I was just struck by how destructive it is to live right like if we want to be alive and we want to have the wood and the plastics and you know and don't get me wrong I want all that stuff too but I mean I don't know this is the result right these are the kinds of hard questions we need to ask ourselves and think about it's not going to happen in my lifetime it it's, it'll happen down the road if we live that long former foundry chihuahua I'm sorry I don't mean to be so like heavy-handed right off the bat let's be funny let me think mm, nope all the jokes I know are are not appropriate for a polite polite company perhaps when I know you guys a little better this is the Agnico Eagle Pinos Altos mine in Chihuahua Chihuahua Mexico Mexico is tore up from mines tore up we talked about that um, a while back we talked about uh, uh, exploration concessions that's when the company comes in and says hey we want to look at what you got and then we have exploitation concessions which is when the company comes in and goes hey we're taking what you got so and I'm not saying I'm against mining you know I, I realize it has to happen on some level but I just think with how smart we are we just need to start finding other ways that's all so I don't know why I had this. No idea. I, <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, some maps and prints for reasons unknown. Oh, you know what? I think I was thinking of Africa. Yes, that is why I was thinking of Africa. These are prints. Uh, P-R-I-N-T-S from Africa, not P-R-I-N-C-E. Um, yeah, I don't... So, Dijen is the oldest and... Um, what is it? Hang on. Crap! Now I have to look it up. It has, like, some sort of distinction. I think it's the oldest oldest place in like the world or something hmm I don't know boy I'm just messing this all up aren't I <laughs> um, it was settled in 200 BC in Africa um, it's near Timbuktu was I doing drugs when I put this together? What the heck? Ladies and gentlemen, Dijen. 
very cool architecture. All right, we're going to keep it moving. Um, as I... <laughs> Lost cities and architecture of pre-colonial Africa. We've, we've been talking about Africa a little bit. And these are just some more photos of pre-colonial African ruins. Um, there's a couple pyramids in here. We've got a bunch of walls. We've got some house uh, architecture. But it's, um, it's definitely worth, worth a look into if you're, if you're into, like, architecture and stuff. Um because it goes into the different, you know, so like I think as a Westerner, like growing up when I thought of Africa, I thought of it as just like, you know, Africa. And then there's South Africa <laughs> and Egypt, right? There's Egypt, Africa, and South Africa. Like that's how I learned Africa. And there's, it's so much more nuanced than that. This is a, uh, the Pyramid of Deng Ker, built by the newer prophet Ngegdeng, in 1906, I'm going to declare myself a prophet. Um, he was an important political symbol of newer resistance to colonial rule. So he resisted colonial rule. I believe that he um, built this pyramid uh, out of like spite or something. But I know at one point it had like whale bones around it. Um, I think I have a picture of that here. Um this is the, the mound from far away. Here we have a dude climbing it. And this is right after it was blown up. So what's happened is there's this village. And the leader of the village is like, listen, you're not, you're not coming into my village. You know, we want to stay separate from you. We want to stay independent. And then right in a strategic area in this location, this guy builds this huge-ass pyramid with whale bones all around it. And it became like the symbol of political resistance. And it got blown up, basically. So that's what happened with that. And he was murdered, apparently, also. So, cheerful. There's the bones. The bones around the pyramid. Um interesting thing I didn't know anything about that's why I'm posting it up these are pictures of people from Texas and these are very very some of these are very Texas looking <laughs> really cool photos though look at that we've got a dog and an Indian tent more dogs in the back this looks like a couple and it was just, they've just gotten married this is Brown's Brownsville, Brownsville, Texas. This is Juan Fela, Vincente Garcia, Florencia Ganja. Pretty sure that's not his name. But there's pictures of uh, Texas before it, you know, became the, the great and bustling state that it is today. Uh, when it was still sort of like really wild. I mean, obviously, there's still parts of it that are wild. Not to mention it's huge. But this is where I was going to stop. Kitty. So this picture was taken in 1866 to 1868. And it was probably taken... Um, doesn't say by whom. It's an ambro type. Very cool. This is Lübeck. Lübeck is a place in Germany. I just thought this was a cool, uh, a cool print. This is how villages were depicted back in the day. You'd get a giant print, and then there would be sort of an idealized drawing of kind of what it looked like with sort of the highlighted, you know, buildings. Like you could look at it, and you could say, "Oh, there's that church, and there's that church," but it's not like you could pick out necessarily oh there's my house or there's that house it was more sort of sort of generalized and idealized so that you had more of an idea of of what it what it looked like so this is Lubeck as we can see not not that different from um from the print very pretty place it looks like city of brick from what I read lots of brick lots of brick 
uh, almost like where I live in, in Poughkeepsie, New York, lots of brick. There's an art installation just uh, like two blocks up the road, and it's made from all of the bricks, all of the different bricks that were made along the Hudson River. So there was like factories all along the Hudson River, and there were lots of brick factories. And all of these different bricks from way back when, the, the like booming industrial era, were collected and made into this sort of um, art installation. It, it's supposed to look like a river. I think the bricks are painted blue. I have not actually seen it, even though it's right up the road. Ukrainian churches in the Canadian prairies. I saw that title and I was like, okay, there we go. Few of the early immigrants would have called themselves Ukrainian, however. They would have identified themselves as Galicians, Ruthenians, Hutzels, Lemkos, or Bukovnians. And uh, half of those people were Greek Catholic and the other half were uh, Greek Orthodox. The first one was built in Manitoba in 1897. So these churches are just so pretty with the onion, the onion dome. I like churches. I should say I like the architecture, the history of the architecture of churches. We won't go into my Byzantine opinions about religion today. <laughs> Maybe another day. <laughs> the only thing I need to know is that if there's a God, I'm not it. It's not me. I'm not the one. Somebody else. <laughs> All right, this is the lemberg Cesarnowitz Railway. I think around at this point, I was just like click happy. I was just like, ooh, that's cool, that's cool, that's cool. Yeah, this was for the architecture. Just some, um, oh yeah, this is this is actually where I was going to stop. Ineris de Dump Pumpfenfroms. So I'm going to go with, that's the pump room. I don't know German, but that seems to be like a pretty good, pretty good guess I think so we're going back to bells I know you're probably thinking there's no way there's anything else you could talk about when it comes to bells and I'm here to tell you <laughs> there's a lot more to talk about when it comes to bells in fact I have a whole other section that's even more exciting than this these are like the tail end from the previous one that I did and the other ones I have are new like about poly polyphonics and stuff um, although I might no, that's in the next one. Where I talk about polyphonics. A rare collection of Bronze Age Chinese bells tells a story of ancient innovation. So these things were found, and they were they sat around in a museum for like eighty years, right? And then they did a like a concert or something, and they didn't have they couldn't find the bell that played the C note, but they discovered if you put this other bell on its side, you could play the C note on the other side of the E note or whatever, whatever. <coughs> and um, then they were like, well, I wonder if the other bells do that. And then they were like, huh. And then they discovered that the bells were designed so that you would create a third so that there would be one sound on one side and one sound on the other side. And also it would depend on how you struck it, where you struck it. Um, there was generally a specific strike place, uh, but you could do all kinds of stuff with it. So this was buried with an emperor, so it was considered to be an important, uh, they call it a musical instrument, even though it's different bells, because it's all, they're all grouped on that, that thing there. And there would be, you know, some people on this side, some people on that side, and they would have the mallets, and they ding, 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 ding. Um, I think I have a video of it next time. So these are, these are some of the bells, some of the big ones and some of the smaller ones. And, oh, look, I do have it. All right, where was I going to go with this? Um, at some point in this video, there are bells being played. You can, you can check it out because I don't remember exactly, exactly where it is. These are some of the bells that are on view at the Smithsonian. If you went there right now, you could go and you could look at them and you could say, oh, hey, that's the bell that Laura was talking about. 
Um, not all of the bells were as serious. This one is obviously more lighthearted, uh, perhaps a rattle for a child um, or just a rattle in general, but certainly not the ritual, uh, the ritual, the ritual bell. Um, and it talks about the different types of bells. So it goes into sort of the history of it, but this is, this is the bell set. Found in the tomb of Marquis Yi of Zheng. So just after 1900, archaeologists began finding curious sets of bells in tombs throughout China. So this talks about when they made that discovery. 20 years later, as Chinese mu musicologists examined a set of these bells, they realized that every bell in the set did that. They were like, oh, <laughs> look at that. The importance of this discovery grows when we realize that it took the West a thousand years to develop the cathedral bell, and we didn't have it until the Middle Ages. Bells are very hard to make, yet China had these remarkably sophisticated zong bells during the Golden Age of Athens. The bells produce a rich tone. They take far less bronze to get it than a cathedral bell, and they deliver two sounds for the cost of one. Acousticians are now just now becoming to understand how they work. They are finding they're really quite hard to play. This high technology, which took the Chinese about a thousand years to perfect, died out completely during the Han period. So then this goes into like we're still we're still discovering stuff about these bells and that there's a lot more to them than just some guy, you know, whacking on it. Servant bells, servant bells, servant bells is like you're sitting, you know, you're rich, you're sitting at your table, you know, you want some butter. Ding, 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 ding. You pull the little the little string and the little bells are wired throughout the house. Now. It sounds like, you know, you just like throw up a bell in every home, but they were all wired to sort of work together. So they needed to be crafted sort of with precision. Um, and they were in rich people's homes, so they needed to be um, installing them. There was a certain art to it. And it was a job that doesn't exist anymore. But for a time, it was a very important job that... Uh, that somebody did certainly for these people this goes into the bell and then it went down into the ceiling it goes into the different components and then this is the i think yes yeah, so this guy talks about how to build a servant bell but you know i thought he was going to show the montage from downton abbey where they ring the bells but perhaps not Hawk bells, uh, hawk bells, hawk bells were uh, not necessarily designed to have multiple tones. They were just designed to be loud, so you could hear your hawk, and you could be like, "Hey, come here, hockey hawk," or whatever. So medieval falconry that was a big deal. Um, I've often thought that if I have had enough money, I would become a falconer because I really like birds. I think I'd be a good falconer. You need a lot of patience, though. That's where I might have a problem. Horse bells, sleigh bells. Sleigh bells ring. Are you listening? Oh, Jesus. I'm so sorry, guys. It's just like, it's like Tourette's. Christmas music Tourette's. That's what I call it. So this talks about the making of, of uh, sleigh bells and who makes them today and where they're made and how it's not so much, it's more looked upon with nostalgia. Horse bells aren't really made so much today, obviously. Um, we're not we're not running around with with bells. Okay, so we're 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 closing in. We're homing in on the round the the <laughs> we're rounding into the home stretch. Okay, here we go. Um. Okay, we already talked about the Dijen. So the Nuk Nuksalk Nation's totem pole was stolen and sold to a museum. After waiting 110 years, they finally have it back. So this is a tribe in British Columbia. And all of their stuff was taken and stuck in a museum. They didn't really have any, you know, say in it. We all cried when it landed on the ground. Nuxal hereditary chief Derek Snow told CNN, it was the feeling when your emotions reach the highest point of your life. I've never dreamed we would be able to do this. The totem pole was carved in the mid-1800s by Snow's great-grandfather, 
Snuxwalta Louis Snow, whose spirit remains in the totem pole and will not be at rest until it is returned to its ancestral home. The people who carved their, spirit, their totem poles were so spiritual, they were chosen to be carvers. They asked the tree to give itself up to them before carving it. They had visions on what to put there. Everything in the Royal BC Museum is sacred because they were created by gifted people and their spirits are still in them. Uh, to us, museums are like the residential schools where our children were killed. They have human remains in the Royal BC Museum, and the spirits of these human remains are there. It's a type of pain that we can't put into words. So this totem pole was, um, was returned. Uh, here it is being blessed along its way as it was being driven. And here, here it is. So here's the, the totem pole. Um, now the Nuxalk Nation, their totem poles are in the news actually for two reasons. The other reason why they're in the news is they're building totem poles on areas that um, are, are uh, relegated for being mined on. And they're saying, well, you can't mine on that land. That's our sacred land. And the government's like, well, you don't actually own that land. And the Indians are like, well... Indians don't actually own any land. We're just, you know, we're just the caretakers, basically. And so they built three totem poles in locations being studied by the Vancouver Mining Exploration Company Juggernaut in the mountaintops around Bella Coola, British Columbia, where the Nuxalk community is based. And the chief says, we want to tell the world that we are still alive and we are still here. So this is an ongoing, an ongoing thing. But the reason why they're so keen to get into this area is because they're, f they're finding veins that are 1,000 meters in strike length. That's a kilometer. And they're 20 meters wide. And they're running up to 3.5 ounces of gold located right on tidewater. So basically what that means is a lot of the gold that we get today is deep, really deep in the ground. And it's hard to get to. And we have to sort of figure out where the pipes are. Um, and then once we find the kimberlite pipes, we know that there's probably diamonds in that area and an area is selected and then the machines and people go in there and dig it up. This basically has the gold like right on top, a huge amount of it, a huge mate, a huge vein going for more than a mile, um, of gold, literally almost like almost a river of gold. And so uh, Juggernaut's really keen to get in there. They've spent 500000 in exploration expenditures. I think that probably translates into legal fees and negotiations and sneaky ways to explore and lawyers. Uh, it's a terrible thing. This is another, um, another family poll that was recently returned so a lot of these um, a lot of these things will hopefully continue to be returned where they should be returned now I have mixed feelings about this because not not about the Nuxalk tribe because they still exist and they're on land where they they should have their it belongs to them right but say you have an area that's torn apart by war it's probably better if those the the items that were in the museum are somewhere far away and s somewhere safe where they can be kept, right? But then when the conflict is over, they should go back. Obviously, that's an idealistic thing. So why did I pull up this thing about a fish, the Eula Chan? So the the Nuxhulk tribe uses the new the the Eula Chan. They use the grease from it. So get this: if you take this fish. And you dye it out and um, you dry it out and you attach a wick inside of it. Like you cut it open and you put a wick in it and then you dry it out. You can light it like a candle and it will burn. A little sputtery, but that's how greasy it is. Here's a photograph of a Nuxalk man. And I saw this and I was like, wow, what a cool picture. And then I was reading about it and this is someone who is in a human a human fair basically or a human e exhibition in Hamburg, Germany. So this man was like displayed 
like something in a museum, which is... Uh, the man in this image took part in live performances while, while on exhibition in zoos across Germany. These performances were the idea of Karl Hagenbach, who provided zoos with wild animals and in 1876 put on exhibitions at zoos with both Inuit and Sudanese people. Good times. Here's the mask dance that the Nuxalk people do. Uh, and they wear these masks that have a string attached to them and it looks one way when it's left alone and then when you pull the string um, it opens up let me find a here we go they're called transformation masks so see there's the string and when you pull it it opens up and then inside of this animal there's a man's face so that's the way it is there's an animal and then a man's face and they have special ceremony ceremonial uh, meaning and purposes they're made from cedar wood, feathers, sinew, cord, bird skin, hide, plant fibers, cotton, iron, and pigments. And they are still made, and they're still made much, much the same way. And they, like I said, they have, they have deep meaning. Family stuff would go on there, personal stuff. Uh, your animal, totem animal would go in there. Um, so those are the transformation, the transformation ma masks. Um. Oh, this is something I, <laughs> this is from Africa, as you get whiplash. This is a crazy throwing knife that they used way back when in Sudan. They And it would take off your head, probably. These are South Dakota. I think I saved this and I was going to do something with it and then and then I got totally distracted. Oh, it's about mining. That's why I saved it. I was I was thinking about mining and how mining isn't just relegated to uh, Canada or Mexico that it's in the United States as well and it's it's still it's still a thing. Um, if you want to get yak penis, you can go to the Gao Li Zhuang restaurant in Beijing. And it's uh, considered the best yak penis in town. It creates impotence in men and it improves the skin texture of women. So, ladies, if you've got bad skin, consider eating some yak penis. This is <laughs> this is old news, but I saw this and this is great because I love goats. And this is a goat that was saved. Uh, it was um, delivered to a farm to live out the rest of its days in old age. Uh, on this particular farm, there's a barn where they do live shows. In particular, they do metal shows, uh, specifically a type of metal called grindcore. My sister could probably tell me exactly what that means. I don't know exactly what that means, but I would imagine it's very hard and fast. And the goat used to wander out of the barn and say, oh, the grindcore, and used to go and hang out, hang out with the band. Used to go and hang out with the band. And it was particularly fond of a band named Worm Rot who just came out with a new album, which I understand is very good. If you're into grindcore, you definitely want to get it. So she, uh, this goat, she ate cigarettes. Uh, she, she would drink the leftover beer. Um, she was a little bit of a, of a, of a, of a maniac. And it said that she would kind of chill in the barn. And then when, when worm rot came on, she'd go to the front and here she is at the front checking out her favorite band pretty cool right Sotheby's has sneakers for auction I've never seen that before on Sotheby's I'm sure it's actually been that I'm sure there's probably been sneakers on, on in the auction house for for a while I just wasn't aware of it but I'm like oh yeah of course of course there's sneakers for auction $25,000 for a pair of Nike Air Jordan 3 retro times Nipsey Hustle Victory Lap size 12 I know both of those men are uh, basketball players. French blockhouses. I think I did this before, but I wanted to show you guys this picture, which I thought was really cool. So a French blockhouse is literally just um, a defensive structure. 
uh, plopped in the middle of some strategic area and people would be in it, you know, looking around, making sure the coast, the coast was clear. Okay, why is the sky dark at night? The sky is dark at night. Why should, why is it dark? If you stand in a small grove of trees and look towards the horizon, you can see patches of sky in the distance between the tree trunks. But if you stand in a large forest, your view is everywhere blocked by a solid wall of tree trunks. Extending the analogy to three dimensions, if the universe of stars is large enough, your line of sight should be blocked in every direction by a solid wall of stars. If you could magnify that view sufficiently, the sky would everywhere look something like the image on the left. There is no image on the left, but it would just be bright light. The entire sky would be about as bright and hot as the surface of the sun. The immense distance the stars making up the wall of light would have no effect on the total amount of energy reaching us. We should be surrounded by a blazing oven of light. Instead, the night sky is practically black. So where does the argument go wrong? So this other guy, uh, Johannes Kepler, who the, tel the telescope is named after, said that... Um, that are we can only see as to a certain distance and then once you go beyond that it's just empty space so he was obviously wrong about that because the stars keep going and different people after him uh you know proposed different solutions and it was called ober's paradox someone said that the starlight is gradually uh, absorbed as it travels through space um that doesn't work uh so get this the first person to explain why the sky is dark and to be publicly like everybody to go to hear it actually hear it and go oh yeah of course was Edgar Allan Poe he suggested that the universe is not old enough to fill the sky with light the universe may be infinite in size he thought but there hasn't been enough time since the universe began for starlight traveling at the speed of light to reach us from the farthest reaches of space Edgar Allan Poe that guy huh First, she got the like the Tartarian brochure thing, right in the barn. Now we've got him proposing major astronomical theories. Crazy. So it's thought that the Big Bang created dust and gas, and possibly water, right? So dust and gas and water just kind of floating around. And this guy's saying that if you take the math. And you do dust and gas and water, it doesn't really work out. Like mathematically, there's something that doesn't quite work out. And that we don't actually understand how that whole thing happens. And he's saying maybe it's mud. Maybe the dirt and the water are floating around and they're they're made out of mud. So which made me think about the sky, which made me go down conspiracy lane with the sky. And this is a theory, possibly only by one person, but the theory is, it's called solid sky theory. So the theory is that the nitrogen in the sky, hang on, let me make sure I got this right. One person said that the nitrogen in the sky got electrified somehow and then became solid and then pressed on everything. And then all the buildings got pushed into the ground and that's why there's this mud flood thing. And that there wasn't actually a mud flood it's that everything got pushed down. But this guy is saying, what is he saying? I say he, it could be a she, or it could be a they. Um, I don't know, we've got melting stone. I lost him somewhere. I don't know exactly what mechanism, but through some mechanism, the sky becomes solid and pushes everything down. And that's the solid sky theory. Now, <coughs> you might laugh and say, well, that's totally ridiculous. Like, Laura, that's ridiculous. But a full page thingy was taken out in 18... 1916, 1916, our air will not fail us. And they are reassuring people that the air will not 
become solid and kill us all. So, you know, we, we, may, we may snorkel at it, but the day the sun disappeared across New England, the event is mostly forgotten, lost to the mist of history. Many people have never heard about it. And the question on this anniversary of that day of darkness is, in our constantly connected world, a world in which we are always in touch, always seemingly in the know, could the kind of fear that all but paralyzed the young nation that day still happen? On that day in 1780, around noon, much of New England, meaning much of New America, went black. At midday, it was midnight. This was not an electrical blackout. Homes and businesses did not have electricity in those years. They were illuminated by lanterns and candles. Rather, the sky turned a deep, complete black, erasing the sun. This was not an eclipse, and this was not a thunderstorm. Imagine, in the middle of a day in May, every bit of light suddenly and inexplicably disappearing from your world. The citizens were terrified. They waited for the darkness to lift, and it did not. Minutes began to feel like months. The birds disappeared and became silent. The fowls retired to roost. Objects could not be distinguished, but at a very little distance, and everything bore the appearance and gloom of night. As the daytime hours of blackness wore on, some people began to think there might never be a light again. There was widespread supposition that Judgment Day may have come. So it lasted for um, the rest of the afternoon, and then it became night, and then the next day the sun came up and people were like, oh, phew, thank God. And then it was forgotten about, but why did it happen? There was never any completely reasonable explanation. It was thought that perhaps it was uh, wildfires in that particular um, part of the world where the, the air was blowing smoke and it was causing everything to go dark. Um, but they really don't know. The poet John Greenleaf Whittier would write of that day, over the fresh earth and the heaven of noon, a horror of great darkness like the night, in day of which Norland sagas tell the twilight of the gods. The low-hung sky was black with ominous clouds, save where its rim was fringed with a dull glow, like that which climbs the crater sides from the red hell below. So we're talking about apocalypse and stuff. So an isolated event? Nope. In Siberia, the sky went dark on July 20th for three hours, and also nobody knows why. So it was July 20th in the middle of the day and the sun went out around 11 a.m. and didn't come back till 2 p.m. I couldn't see a thing. We took torches to walk outside, but nobody wanted to be on the street because the feeling was if something heavy in the air was pressing on your chest. Uh, the obvious culprit appears to be some of the wildfires raging elsewhere in Siberia. Um, but conspiracy theorists are saying, hmm... Not so fast. Maybe something else is going on. So it does actually, it has actually happened in history where the sun has completely disappeared. And if you go to Reddit and you type in sun disappearing into the search thing, there are people who will say that it's the middle of their day, they're eating a sandwich or whatever, and the sun will disappear for like a split second and come back. It's a real thing, I swear. All right. NASA shuts down the Hello, Hello Vero, Helio Vero, the viewer. NASA shuts down live cam after conspiracy theorists spot black cube coming out from the sun. Now, normally I would scoff at this particular article. Oh, you know what? I probably scrolled past this. I thought I saved it on my phone. Probably not. Ooh, I did. Here we go. No, don't go away. Don't go away. Okay, here we go. So there was the kerfuffle over the kerfuffle, kerfuffle over the balloons floating around the United States and Latin America and uh, Canada. But there are actual crafts that are defying gravity and the known laws of man that we are not talking about so there have been let me find it mm. 
I'm sorry, guys. Oh, here we go. On a clear, sunny day in April 2014, two F-A-18s took off air combat training, blah, 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 blah. And then they suddenly saw a dark gray cube inside of a clear sphere, motionless against the wind, fixed directly at the entry point. The jets, only 100 feet apart, zipped past the object on either side. They landed immediately and they were like, you know, and then the pilots said that they had been plaguing that particular area for eight months. So for eight months, experienced pilots, this is men with training, flight training, sky observation training, are seeing a black cube inside a clear sphere doing stuff that aircraft simply cannot do. And they have no explanation and nobody is looking into it and nobody's talking about it. So I read this and it's like a small cubic shaped uh, object emerges for about two seconds in the bottom right corner of the sun. Um, the video comes to an abrupt stop and the screen goes blank. And this person is saying um, that there's a cover up and that NASA doesn't want us to know. Uh, why are they hiding this? Is the sun birthing something? Is it an alien? Um, we deserve to have open, uh, open source uh, information on our heliospheric data. After all, it's our sun, right? We all depend on it. And NASA's like, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. No transparency. So they don't want to freak people out. So... It, I don't want to go so far as to say there's aliens because there's probably would be robotic probes before there were aliens, but that's not to say that we aren't being watched on some level by something. Who knows? So anyway, we've come to the end, if you can believe it, which is crazy, right? And we are going to look at some art by Lenora Carrington, who's one of my favorite artists. In fact, she's, nope, it's not her art at the, at the, on, on my banner. It's uh, Remedios Feral. But the two of them were friends, so I was close, I guess. I hope everyone has a great day, and I'm going to follow this up potentially with some art stuff, depending.